Welcome to In The Funnel. My name is Mark Cox. In The Funnel is a group of sales coaches and consultants that help B2B sales teams dramatically improve revenue. Clients come to us when revenue growth is stagnated, or their sales team is not meeting expectations, or they need to recalibrate their sales and go-to-market plan for the upcoming year. Our clients have enjoyed tremendous success working within The Funnel, and please, hear it straight from them by listening to the testimonial section of this website. What they'll tell you is there's two things that make us unique and different in our space. Number one, we have a process and a methodology. First, for understanding your current state, and then second, for building your sales and go-to-market plan for the upcoming year. The second thing that makes us unique and different is that everybody within the funnel has run a material sales organization in their recent past. We're all practitioners. We don't have any theorists or teachers. And what that means is we can get in front of your sales team and run the next sales meeting or join them on their next sales call to close your next large prospect. All of us have a passion for professional, disciplined, process-driven sales. And we'd be delighted to talk to you if you're looking to grow revenue for your company, please feel free to reach out to us through this website at info at inthefunnel.com or by telephone. Thanks for taking the time to watch this. Uh, technology is constantly eroding the base of the pyramid. And by the way, that's where most people hang out. But if you th right, or really like that eroding the, the base of the pyramid. And, 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 and I talk about why you want to move up. And I really invite you. I, and all this stuff's there. It's for free. I mean, it's not a come on for anything. It's oh, yeah. There. We'll have the link in the show notes. Yeah. It'll be in there. Uh, but in any event, and then preferred supplier solution consultant. And then we change to strategic collaborator because we've seen that. We have data that supports the fact that people uh, are bringing folks in later when they do bring them in. Or if they bring them in earlier, it's because they want to collaborate with them. Um, and, and we can talk about, you know, the three reasons that they do and how the needle's pointing the wrong way. And then ultimately, um, a trusted co-creator. We think that sales has moved from persuasion to co-creation and has been on that path for some time. I think Gerhard Schlutner has even been saying much the same thing in his, you know, sales conferences for the last several years. He's talked about co-creation. And, um, and clearly that's happening and people just aren't going to put up with, you know, being manipulated or, you know, yeah. whatever conned or shoved around or that's not going to happen. So those are the five levels of relationship. And again, I think they reflect, um, you know, what the data is telling us about people wanting to mitigate or eliminate risk and will reward people uh, with higher levels of relationship when they understand that you can help them do that. Team, the reason we run the Selling Well podcast is to help improve the performance and professionalism of B2B sales. And we see this as a profession. And the joy of doing this podcast is we frequently get a chance to talk to kindred spirits. And we've got one today on the show for you. Got just a great guy, Barry Trailer, and today Barry's a partner with Sales Mastery, and and recently Sales Mastery's conducted a couple of very very important surveys, and in fact they were published at the Harvard Business Review, this November December 2022 issue. The article is called "Can AI Really Help You Sell," and Barry wrote the article with teammates at Sales Mastery of Jim Dickey, Boris Graziberg, and Ben Shapiro. Um, two of which are kind of legends at Harvard. So, so fantastic article you're going to want to check out. Um, however, when I, when I did a deeper dive on Barry's background, what a career Barry's had after starting as a professional engineer, then migrating into sales, as many of us did, you know, at that period of time, 20 or 30 years ago, um, he then formed and founded CSO Insights. And many of you will know them as 
one of the best research firms in professional selling for years and years and years, so much so that Miller Hyman acquired them. And, and with Miller Hyman, Barry ended up conducting 400 different training workshops for Miller Hyman. So, so he's really this student of sales training and sales enablement, and still today on this mission of elevating the professionalism of B2B sales. And that's where our conversation goes today. So, so just a, he, Barry's one of those people that I could have spoken to for hours, frankly, because I just, he's lived through many of the best sales training programs um, in the world, really even today. And, and he's seen this evolution of, of B2B selling where, you know, it's a little bit back to the future. Some things have stayed the same and then some things have certainly changed like the strength and the, the leverage of the buyer in today's marketplace. So we, we have a great conversation today, mostly driven by the fact that Barry's principle is, you know, there, there is an opportunity to continue to work on elevating our professionalism in B2B sales. And he thinks one of the biggest opportunity is by establishing and elevating our relationships with our buyers over time. And that's some of the things that Sales Mastery have dedicated, you know, their work towards. Uh, you'll read in the article, and we'll talk about here today, something that they call the sales performance scorecard. And the sales performance scorecard sort of measures how you're doing today with the vertical access, talking about the level of relationship you have with a client, and the horizontal access, talking about the level of process. Um, but Barry's really seen lots of this over the course of the last 20 or 30 years, more than me. And, and by, by the way, that's why I was so interested in this conversation. And he's got some really interesting ideas about the future. One of the ones I think is great is we talk about how important the sales development role is today and how hard it is. And Barry sort of turns conventional wisdom on the head by thinking maybe the most senior of salespeople should be in a sales development job, not the most junior of salespeople. Um, folks, I really enjoyed our conversation today. Um, I'm sure you will too. So if you do, when you listen to this podcast, please like and subscribe to the Selling Well podcast. But here's Barry Trailer. You're going to enjoy it. Hey, Barry, welcome to the show and thanks so much for joining. Hey, Mark, glad to be here. Thanks. So, so Barry, you've kind of got one of these dream careers for someone like me because I'm a student of professional sales. I've spent most of my adult life with this as my career. And with your background with Miller Hyman, then CSO Insights, um, the earliest versions of CRM with Goldmine. You had just an amazing career that everybody would be interested in. Tell us a little bit, maybe the short story of your journey in professional sales. You know, it's funny, um, different folks, uh, Howard Stevens was one, there are several others, but Howard Stevens was, you know, the head of Chally uh, for a number of, maybe he started Chally. And, um, he would ask audiences, you know, how many people here when they were growing up said they wanted to be a sales rep? And I would raise my hand and <laughs> you, you were the only maybe, one. Maybe one or two people yeah, out of two or three hundred people in the room. Would... <laughs> and, and I, you know, I just really felt that way. And, and I've had a chance to uh, to look at why that was. In fact, I actually spoke on, about that at, at one conference. Um, my very first job was in retail, uh, you know, when I was like 12 years old, I got a Christmas job in retail. I sold uh, parents' magazines, working birth leads. I sold encyclopedias door to door. I mean, I, <laughs> yes, no, I, uh, and then I was back in retail for a while. And then, um, you know, I was in school and I made a left turn when I got out of college and uh, my degree was in engineering and I became an engineer for uh, 10 years. And uh, the first half of that was as a field engineer in underground construction, and then working for a public municipality when I got my registration, my license here in California. And then I went into private practice, selling engineering uh, and planning services, both okay. in the public and private sector. And I wouldn't even say that was when my professional selling began, but it certainly is what set me on, on my path. Um, 
I did that for five years and there, I did some good things and, and I don't, we don't have the time and nobody has the interest, but there were a couple of very cool things I did that um, had to do with, you know, changing the game. Um, but at one point, there's a fellow named Jim Rohn. I don't know if you know his name, but of he, course, of he course, was sort of Tony Robbins mentor. And uh, he had a huge impact on me. And I listened to all his tapes and yeah, I even started talking like him. It was fun. But, <laughs> he talks about the day that turns your life around. And um, I, I could tell you exactly the day that was in engineering. And that was it. I just, it was over. And mm. we had, we had gotten a ton of work based on this thing I was talking about a moment ago, this new way of getting projects. And my boss um, said, we just want you to take it easy. You know, we have too much work. Just take it easy. I said, well, that's good. Cause I'm leaving. <laughs> I'm going to spend the next three months um, finding, you know, a, a thing to do. Okay. And, uh, and don't ask me what I'm doing because for you, the answer is nothing. I'm doing exactly what you asked me to do. If you want me to do something like that. And so I went around, I talked to folks in, in um, uh, commercial industrial real estate, headhunting, computers and finance. And I'd been out of school for 11 years at that point. So I knew a lot of folks. And just tell me about a day in the life of kind of thing. And met a guy, Jerry Stanfield, who was a mortgage broker. And I went to work for him and uh, he really lit my wick in terms of uh, self improvement, and mm. that's when I that's when I encountered Jim Rohn's tapes, and and then I met Jim Rohn. Uh, we had lunch with him, and and read the books, and listened to the tapes, and you know got on the program, and um, and then got into sales training with that company, and then when that was over, I was introduced to Miller Hyman, and that that really kind of cemented it. Um, things that we had had struggled with in engineering, like who should go to the interview and do we want senior management to go to represent commitment or do we need the project engineer to show? You know, yeah. it, when I went through strategic selling for the first time, <laughs> it was like the scales fell away from my eyes. I, you know, I, <laughs> When we got to the blue sheet, I almost literally had tears in my eyes thinking about <laughs> how much wasted energy we, we expended. And um, so I just took to that, you know, like a doctor water. And, and that really, that was in uh, 83. Wow. Yeah. So that was, you know, 41 years ago. And, you know, I was like the son born of those two fathers, you know, Bob and Steve. And I was actually pure Miller Heinemann, either one of them. And it just, you know, I still think the stuff is bulletproof. You know, it's 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 been around it a is. long time, but in terms of buyer buying influences, modes, ratings, now people talk about ICP, um, you know, all the time. But ideal customer profile came from strategic selling. You know, they didn't call it that before before strategic selling. There are some, you know, just generally good ideas that will never go out of date, and you know. Um, Miller Hyman is one, the blue sheets, you know, blue sheet is one. And this concept that multiple people weigh in on the decision and, you know, any key decision, they all have personal wins and professional wins. Mm -hmm. there, there was a lot of talk about 10 years ago, 15 years ago saying, Hey, this is new. It was never new if you were doing large deals. Right. So it, it's been in existence. I went through 10 years after you in the early nineties. Fantastic. Um, I do nothing but read. So many, every sales book that comes out as I interview, you know, great folks like yourself, um, Barry, and the amount of Miller Hyman that pervades every single professional sales book almost is shocking. And in some cases, 60% of the book is Miller Hyman. Well, and, you know, and, and back in the day, target account selling, uh, Art Jacobs and Austin Gardner, power based selling with Jim. Um, solution selling, Mike Bosworth. I mean, everybody, it was like fill in the blank selling. How can we say the same thing differently so that we can copyright it and sell it for a bunch of money and do training? But they're all basically saying the same thing. And, you know, I thought Taz had a great, they had 20 questions, four questions, five sub questions. Is there a deal? Can we compete? Can we win? Is it worth winning? Yeah. And then you went through the five questions 
of each of those, and it basically was filled out a blue sheet. <laughs> but you know, so, you know, uh, the thing I uh, just say this because art came from military. They had a lot of, you know, do you have flanking or direct assault? I never really cared for that languaging. But in terms of just analyzing the situation, it was very simple. Well, that's what, by the way, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for some strategic tool that I can use to assess how I'm doing in a sales cycle, you know, and then figure out what do I do now to improve my chances of winning the sales cycle? Frankly, with the thousands of salespeople I've trained and the, the you know, um, little over a hundred companies we've worked with on a consulting side, they all struggle with it still. So those are the these are key questions that it's it's hard to figure these things out if you don't have some sort of framework. And I I you know I always joke I had this conversation with Frank Cespedes, sure. I, I, you know a couple of a couple of months back when I was in Boston and I kind of see him as a bit of a mentor and I, and it was troubling me that these age old problems in sales, the solutions have been around for 40 and 50 years. And he sort of counseled me and said, listen, don't be looking for the next silver bullet. He said, of course, the problems have been around for 50 years. The solutions have been for 50 years. It's human beings working with human beings. Nothing changes. Like, Win Friends and Influence People is still one of the best business books any new salesperson should read, and it's 100 years old. Yeah, As a Man Thinketh, Think and Grow Rich, yeah, How I Raised My Self from Failure to Success in Sales by Frank Betcher. I mean, it just goes on. No BS Selling by Hank Trisler. I mean, I read, I read them all. I actually can't keep up with them all now, although I, I do my best. Uh, you know, I went through Lee Salt's book recently, and I get sent a lot of books. Sometimes they're asking for quotes, uh, sometimes they're not. But in any event, um, you know, Anthony annarino has got a bunch of stuff out. Great guy. Good stuff. Um, you know, just, there's a lot out there. I think, I, th I think there are a couple of things. One is, um, there, there's, in fact, I'm writing a, an article for the Sales Education Foundation for their annual magazine, uh, comes out early next year. And, and there are a lot of things that have changed and there are a lot of things that have not changed, okay? Now, clearly uh, the power shift from sellers having all the information to buyers having all the information before they ever talk to a seller to the internet and communities and you know, all, on and on. Um, the impact of technology and how that, you know, uh, in many ways, I think the, the sales conversation has been hijacked by the vendors and, and you know, that many of them are sponsors of ours and good friends, but still, I think people sort of have this unwarranted faith in the technology and are forgetting about, you know, the fundamental substance of what we're up to here, which is, you know, connecting folks and what I've called establishing and elevating relationships over time. But let me give you a couple of examples of, of things that, that I think are, constant and yet changing. This is one that I've been doing at conferences back back when people were showing up. <laughs> That's back, by the way. It's, it's, it's back. back. It's coming back now. I just came back from New York at a conference. 2015 or 2016. A couple hundred people in the room. So, you know, I'd like to volunteer. Somebody come up on stage. Everybody's interested in best practices. Let me show you one right now. And so you'd come up on stage and then Mark, Barry Trailer, good to meet you. Firm handshake, eye contact. It's all great, great. Everybody see that? Yep, yep. Okay, let's do it again. And I do the same thing, only, you know, whatever you call it, cold fish or limpers, whatever. Yep. And and not make eye contact. And the person would go, oh, no, or you forget yeah. it. They'd start giggling or something. And to the people watching, it looked exactly the same. But for the person, for you up on stage, it was completely different. Yeah. And there are two things about that that I think are, you know, worthy of conversation. You had Dan Pink on, you know, a few months ago, and I talked to him a little bit about this. I think there's something here. The first is, what is the equivalent of a firm handshake, firm grasp, clear eye contact in an increasingly remote, high-speed internet connected world? What is that? And and I have a few ideas, and I think there are other things that could support that as well. We can go down that path if you want. But the other thing is, and I think this is the part that's not changing. That's the part that's changing. Here's the part that's not changing. 
when I did that funky, you know, whatever handshake and the person was like, no, forget. It's like they didn't think about it. It was instantaneous. It was limbic. It was, you know, automatic. And it was atavistic. It would just happen. Mm -hmm. And it was like they didn't think. Let me think. Do I trust this guy or not? I mean, it was like instantaneous. And that's our DNA, man. And that is not changing. And our need for connection and our need for trust. You know, the Zig Ziglar said there are five reasons people won't buy from you. No money, no need, no desire, no urgency, no trust. Hmm. And that last one will kill more deals than the other four combined. So what are we doing right now in our outbound efforts and our outreach efforts that's destroying trust? And I've got, my feeling is we're doing a lot. Yeah. How long do you have? I, I mean, the reality of it is our outbound, you know, I'll, I'll speak to what's being done well. Outbound efforts where it's not generic and template, they actually know who they're reaching out to. They lead with 70% value. They know me, my business, my industry. They understand some of the- Those things have never have. changed, by the way. Those things have been the same for 50 years. Yeah. Of course. And, and why, you know, it's probably been the same for thousands of years. You know, um, his name is Dr. Morgan. He wrote a book called, I forget his first name, Can You Hear Me? Mm. But what he tried to capture as part of that book was exactly what the, the example you did on stage, Barry, which is as soon as we meet somebody like in, in milliseconds subconsciously, what we're trying to determine is your intent. And so is your intent to harm me, to help me? Is it about you? Is it about me? Do you have commission breath? Or, you know, are you about helping me? And many of these triggers are subconscious. And, oh, and well, like 80% of 90%, of them, they say that something like 80 or 90% is nonverbal. Right. And, and, oh, by the way, you know, in terms of what we're doing here today and, and why I started this journey, you know, 40 years ago, um, I think we've just scratched this. Miller Hyman, great, great, great. There's, there is not a bigger booster of Miller Hyman in the world than me. I think we've just scratched the surface mm -hmm. in terms of establishing and elevating relationships and this stuff about intent and intentionality and being of service and what, you know, people, a lot of people think professional sales is an oxymoron, you know, like professional wrestling. I don't agree with that, man. I'm all over this stuff. And I think that, you know, if we got better and better at this, this is actually the talk I gave back in 26. I think it'd be a better world. That's, you know, that's why I'm doing this. And and I think we're, I think we're on our way, by the way. I think I, a lot of the firms we use, uh, we work with are just spectacular. And you get these, you know, CEOs that, that have visions that are completely aligned with putting the, you know, loving the customer, putting the client first, making sure it's all about them. I think there, there is this common sense revolution that's starting to, to actually, you know, um, pervade out there. And by the way, the, there, you said there's no bigger advocate of Miller Hyman than you. There's one Alice Hyman and she was on the show a month ago. So may, she might have slightly more. Uh, well, I know, I know Alice and, and her sister Liz both. And I think I met, Liz, we were talking, I saw him at Dreamforce, I guess it was last year. On it. Anyway, we were talking and, and I met Liz Hyman when she was 16. <laughs> oh, is that right? Wow. Okay. And, and I, I don't know how old Alice was, but uh, she wasn't a lot older. And I, yeah, they're both great. I love them both. Yeah, yeah, Alice. Just, Alice was just fantastic on the show and just a spectacular diamond, dynamo and super positive energy yeah. that kind of came across. But so, so Barry, with all that background in CSO and all the research you've done, you'll be on the show a number of times. But today, what I would like to talk to, I'd like to kind of lean into a great article that you and some buddies of yours put together. Can an AI really help you sell? And it can, depending upon when and how you implement it. Just happen to have a copy. Uh, as do I. Oh, Thank good. Well, well, there you go. So, we didn't make the cover, but we are a featured article. So yeah, I was, I was, by the way, I was having a hard time refinding this. I oh. don't know when I reached out to you a month ago or so ago, but I was trying to find it. You're not on the cover. You should be on the cover. No, we're not. 
but it's the, which issue? It's H, uh, Harvard Business Review, November, December, 2022. November, December, 2022. Yep. And in fairness, it's with you and Jim Dickey and Ben Shapiro and Boris Groziberg. Groisberg, yes. Groisberg, thank you. And actually, if memory serves, this would have been a long time ago. I think I was in a classroom with Ben Shapiro on negotiations. Uh, well, you may have been. So you mentioned Frank Cespedes earlier. Frank yes. has been an adjunct at Harvard. Great guy. Uh, I was presenting down in Fort Myers at a conference. He was on ahead of me and he had a great question. I, I still remember him kicking off his talk by asking, what is the rarest commodity in business today? What is the scarcest commodity in business today? And everybody's, you know, what capital yeah. or whatever he said accountability. Wow. Yeah. And I think he was right on then. And I think he's still right on. Anyway. Um, yeah. He's on, the, he's on the show on Friday again. Yeah. He's a good guy. He's a good um, guy. So Ben Shapiro is an icon in, in marketing and anyone who's been through the Harvard B school or been through extension. He was the closest anybody actually got to talking about sales for a long, long time. Oh, is that right? Oh, yes. And, you know, he's former dean and chairman of the department. And I think he is the most published person in HBR uh, track record. Oh. Um, and I met him in, um, gosh, I'm going to say like 2005 or something. Okay. And I sent him a copy of our, uh, what we were calling then our SPO, the sales performance optimization uh, study. And um, I had met with him, an executive I knew had, had thought we would get along. And so I reached out to him. And when I was in, uh, in Boston, I went and spent an afternoon with him. And he's just one of these guys, being in the same room makes you feel smarter. <laughs> he's just... He's funny, he's humble, he's really, really bright. He's been around. Anyway, really good guy. And um, and so after that, when our report came out, it was like 220 pages back, I sent him a copy of our report. Yeah. And, uh, and then I didn't hear anything for, uh, I don't know, a few weeks. So I called him up and I said, hey, did you get it? And he said, I got it and I'm, and I'm really upset. And I said, what are you upset about? He said, I set aside two hours to read it. And I spent the entire day. Oh, wow. And What's he said, I'm reading your report. I, I remember this like it was yesterday. He said, I was just drooling because here were all of these things that I had talked about in my classes for years. And here was data supporting. It. He said the first time I ever saw data. And, and that was, that was very rewarding. And, and we obviously stayed in touch and been friends ever since. And Boris Groisberg, we, Ben introduced us to Ben, uh, sorry, to Boris four years ago when we first started on this journey with them. And um, uh, Boris is a terrific uh, guy. And he's, he's I, th I, I don't know if this is fair, my impression, he's sort of the golden boy of the marketing department in HBR right now. Oh, wow. He, he does wow. great. He does great. Well, I think at some point in time. So anyway, yeah, yeah. That, that was our team. Ben, Boris, Jim, and, and, uh, and me. Well, what a powerhouse team. So, so by the way, let's talk about this because, okay, you know, what happened was you guys did, um, you, you, given your past, you leveraged some research from CSO with a thousand sales leaders, mm -hmm. but Sales Mastery also did some research on this as well. And do you remember a little bit of that research with the 500 sales organizations? And I know this, you sure. probably wrote this a year ago, but um, tell us a little bit about the research and some of the key findings. Well, so there, you know, there, I feel like I have to give you all this background I'm going to use all the time. I'm just, <laughs> so Jim and I started um, CSO Insights back and we partnered up in 2002. I won't even, or 2001, I won't even tell you all the history before that, but in any event. Um, Great. We, by the way, I loved that organization. Everything you produced was of high value. There was a massive appetite for people who were running big league sales organizations for that kind of data. There wasn't very many places to get it. Uh, no wonder you were such an attractive acquisition partner. 
um, uh, or prospect. It was a great, great organization. I loved CSO. Well, thanks. And, and we had a good run. Uh, we were acquired by, you know, coincidentally by Miller Hyman in 2015, had a two year earnout, and at the end, everybody did what they said they were going to do. We met all our performance hurdles. It was great. And we started Sales Mastery in 2018. And uh, we were focused on two things AI for sales, which, yeah, you know, this is, and sales as a profession, which is what, you know, I've been curious about and dedicated to for a long time now. And um, shortly after that, Miller Hyman and by extension, CSO Insights were acquired by Corn Ferry. Right. And over the next year, year and a half, they either laid off or all the analysts left. And so we were, uh, you know, in touch with them because they were still doing the surveys, but they had no analysts. So I reached out to them and said, you know, is there something here we could do? And we entered into a joint research agreement with them. And, um, and so and the reason I'm giving you this background is some of the surveys you're talking about were in that period, and then they're, they're our own work, the most recent work. So uh, we did a buyer study with them in 2018, and again in 2021, we did a virtual selling study with them in 2020 uh, as part of, you know, in, in, during COVID. We had, right. That was really interesting. We had, we launched that study like in uh, January, February of 2020, and then COVID hit. Nice timing. Yeah. We had like 250 or so responses and then we stopped. And then we started gathering data again in like June, July after the vaccine was out and people had started to figure out what was what. So we had like pre and during COVID data, ah. another 200, it was really interesting stuff. And so that was great. And then we did the world-class study, which when we got acquired by Miller Hyman, they had the world-class study. We had this SPO. And so we started alternating. We did SPO on um, even years and world-class on odd number years. And so oh, the last okay. thing we did with Corn Ferry was uh, the world-class study that came out. Well, we released our version of it January 1st, and then they finally released you know, their version a few months later. And, and it just, it was difficult, uh, time consuming. They're a big outfit, we're a little outfit, you know, a lot of just very difficult communications. And so we, we both agreed to just part ways. Um, and then we did as a result of that, and in a long story, just a little bit longer, <laughs> they actually let CSO Insights as a brand die. They, oh, did they really? What a shame. It, it's gone. And by the way, Miller Hyman is not far behind. I mean, everything now is Corn Ferry strategic selling. And then I think it says, you know, buy Miller Hyman or something. And, and this yeah, is going a, to go away. I frankly just don't get, but that's yeah. what it goes. You know, it's, their, it's, it's their property. They can do whatever they want with it. Right. Um, but because of that, and because we were saying, you know, are you, are you interested in doing research? Because they have a huge research institute, Corn Ferry but not in this area. And it turned out they really weren't interested necessarily in the B2B area. They like talent, HR and compensation, stuff like that. But, you know, the, the basic blocking and tackling and technology and so on. And, and they said, we don't, you know, we don't think so and you're free to go. And so we did. And that's when we did the survey, the, the 850 that you're talking about, a thousand. It wasn't really, it was about 850 for the, what we call the sales performance scorecard study. Now, all of that, there's stuff from the buyer study from 2018 and 2021. There's stuff from uh, our survey this year, 2022, uh, that went into uh, the article. And then the case studies, you know, we, we had some that we originally proposed. And then because of COVID and a bunch of other things, uh, it took a couple of years. And so we wound up updating um, you know, some of the cases that you mentioned, but that's how it came into being. And I think, uh, and I'll take a breath here in just a second. One of the <laughs> things that I think was really significant about, I think it's the most significant thing in the article is the new model that we have, the new framework we're calling the sales performance scorecard. In the article, they call it the sales success scorecard. Um, 
SSS just didn't sound right to me. So we're calling it the SP. They actually call it the sales success matrix. I know oh, you yeah. wrote it a little yeah. while back for it to get in there. I yeah. do that all the time too. But yeah. it's the SSM. But, and it is an, an extension of and an updating of the SRP matrix, the sales relationship process matrix that we yeah. first introduced in 2007. So, um, and that people love that thing because you could look at, we, you know, when we were consulting, perhaps you used it. We would ask people, where would you say you are in levels of relationship? Well, I'd say we're about here. And how about process? You know, how do you divide? Well, we have this, this, this. Oh, I'd say we're about here. Great. How's that working for you? Well, mm -hmm. not great. And if, you know, where do you think you need to be in the next couple of years uh, to be saying, oh, no, we need to be up here. And it's like, oh, okay. Well, and, and it just, it went on like an old shoe. I mean, people just understood it. And, and I think the uh, sales performance scorecard is going to be very much the same. It's updated to reflect changes in the buy sell equation power. And we've also added a fifth level of process implementation to reflect artificial intelligence and machine learning in that role, not just CRM and ABM and you know the MarTech and sales tech, but now AI and ML. It's a whole other dimension. And so and and we collected data on that this year's survey. So we're off to the races on the well, so much to unpack there, Barry. There, there's a couple of things we all have to kind of struggle and challenge, uh, be challenged by here. But I, what I definitely like about the sales success matrix is there's a, a, the simplicity of it. So, so we'll talk about that in a sec. But at the core, it seems amazing to many of us listening today. But you know, at the core, the problem was. Um, most companies are still not using basic sales technology or AI effectively. So that that's the core problem statement of the article. Even though we've got the technology out there, it's it's amazing today. Mm -hmm. And then this idea that said, <laughs> it's one word for it. <laughs> like like it really is shocking. Amazing is <laughs> yeah. It's just at the beginning. Yeah. Of well, we'll we'll try and keep it as positive as we can. Yeah. Okay. But, there you go. You know. <laughs> And then this, you know, the, the simple formula that says, well, listen, the more tools we have, the better the data, the better the data, the better the algorithm and the better the algorithm, better off you're going to be. So, yes. so it's, Hey, if you but, use, yeah. if you use them, but, but admittedly, you know, we've had um, Tony Hughes and Justin Michael from tech powered sales on the show. Mm -hmm. I mean, back then there was 5,000 different, uh, um, uh, tech stack, sales tech stack items out there for consideration. If you read their book, which is fantastic, yeah. it's fantastic. But even that, trying to stay current with the stuff in their book, which is already dated, tough to do. Mm -hmm. You can start to see where companies get overwhelmed by the sales tech stack and figuring out, okay, what are the 10 different categories or even eight different categories? And what do I put in each one? But but let's help them out here a little bit just on the sales success matrix. So those listening, think of a vertical and a horizontal axis, the vertical level of relationship with your, with your client, the horizontal level of process, as Barry said, the, the relationship levels go from at the bottom being transactional to the, the, the trusted co-creator at the top with five stages in between, that which we're always trying to aspire to Let's talk about that just a little bit, Barry. Sure. And, and a couple of things I'll mention. I, I did do a video on the sales performance scorecard. It'll be up uh, by the time this gets published, it'll be up. So I'll Great. That. So I think that's worth noting. And uh, oh, also, uh, there's a uh, in our sales school 2.0, which is our YouTube channel, or if you go to our website, salesmastery.com. There's uh, a video on levels of relationship with the old levels, the original levels, which I first came out with in 1992 or 93, okay. which were um, approved vendor, preferred supplier, solution consultant, strategic contributor, and ultimately trusted partner or trusted advisor. Now, in answer to your question and, and what we did in, in the article is we've now relabeled a few of those, it's now transactional vendor because that's happening more and more. And if you watch the levels of relationship video, what I say is that 
uh, technology is constantly eroding the base of the pyramid. And by the way, that's where most people hang out. But if you right, or I really like that eroding the, video, the base of the pyramid, and, and 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 I talk about why you want to move up, and I really invite you. I, and all this stuff's there; it's for free. I mean, it's not a come on for anything. It's oh yeah, there. we'll have the link in the show notes. Yeah. It'll be in there. Uh, but in any event, and then preferred supplier solution consultant, and then we change to strategic collaborator because we've seen that we have data that supports the fact that people. Uh, are bringing folks in later when they do bring them in, or if they bring them in earlier, it's because they want to collaborate with them. Um, and, and we can talk about, you know, the three reasons that they do and how the needle's pointing the wrong way. And then ultimately, um, a trusted co-creator. We think that sales has moved from persuasion to co-creation and has been on that path for some time. I think Gerhard Schlotner has even been saying much the same thing in his you know sales conferences for the last several years he's talked about co-creation and um and clearly that's happening and people just aren't going to put up with you know being manipulated or you know yeah. whatever conned or shoved around or whatever. that's not going to happen so those are the five levels of relationship and again i think they reflect um, you know, what the data is telling us about people wanting to mitigate or eliminate risk and will reward people uh, with higher levels of relationship when they understand that and can help them do that. And I'm just going to jump in. So, so let's stay sure. there for a second, because I don't think that's a hard sell for anybody listening that they want to elevate their status at the relationship level. And when they do that, by the way, lots of other great things happen. You know, as you can imagine, right? You're not getting commoditized. Uh, price elasticity goes, you know, um, becomes a lot lower. Um, you know, it's okay to work with, you don't have to have the best product set as long as you're the best partner. There's a lot of those things that come in at that level. If you can achieve that level of relationship, how do you achieve that level of relationship? I'm so glad you asked. Okay. <laughs> So I, you know, this is going to sound absolutely self-promoting, but it's just because uh, I want this stuff out there. I don't want to be carrying all this around in my head. Watch the levels of relationship video. Okay. You know, it's 10 minutes or something. Oh, sure. And, and I talk about there are things that go up as you move up in levels of relationship, like trust, credibility, access, referrals, referenceability, and so on. There are things that go down as you go up in levels of relationship. Things like um, the probability of success. Uh, uh, things that go down. Uh, sorry, things that go down. Uh, cycle time goes down. Uh, um, uh, number of people you compete with goes right. down. Right. Uh, you know, competitive bake offs go down. Yeah. And the significance of any feature or function goes down at the low of your product at the lowest level they're used as a gating device at higher levels you know doesn't matter they need it. well it depends on whether it does or doesn't if it doesn't they will say will you have it in time so here's and this is in in the video but i'll go ahead and say it anyway risk since that's where you jumped in and kind of lit you up risk is really interesting because it's on both sides just like time is on both sides. As you move up through levels of relationship, the amount of time you spend with them is going up. The amount of time they're spending with you is going up. But cycle time is going down. Mm -hmm. Okay, really interesting. Okay. Risk is another one. As you move up, the risk of losing the deal is going down. But the risk of the deal is going up because they're making bigger bets with you. Mm. And I talk about that in the video. And I, you know, this is like stuff we figured out in, you know, of research and all of that, just experience everything. Uh, and once you hear it, it's like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so, you know, you, you should go hear it. The other two, and I, I don't know, I, I suggested you watch these before we got together. I don't know if you did or not, but I did two parts on calling high. Everybody says you should call high. I don't know if you looked at either of those, but I didn't. No, okay. I didn't. Sorry. Well, I'll give away part one and it's still got good stuff in it. And then part two, because it has to do 
with the question, how do you do this? Okay, great. How do you do this? So part one, calling high. The subtitle is my big fat Greek wedding. Wow, okay. there's interesting. You remember that movie? Of course I do. Okay, what do you remember from the movie? Well, first of all, I loved it. Great. Me too. Um, what else would I remember from the movie? Um, very authentic. She was very authentic. The guy was um, a very famous actor. The lady was Canadian actress, actually. Okay. What was the what was the father's answer to everything? Uh, I can't remember. I remember the actor though, very famous actor. Okay, number one, anything worthwhile, anything that had ever been invented that was worthwhile was Greek. Oh, okay. You, you could always trace it back to fun. Know, Aristotle or Socrates. Yeah, that, that's and fun. the answer to every problem in the world was Windex. Right. Okay. Okay. And. So I actually got this from Steve Hyman a long, long time ago. When you're, and again, I'm, I'm giving the spoiler alert here and you should still watch this thing. I don't well, that's know. why they should listen to the podcast. Eight minutes or something, but here's the deal. People on top of organizations, highly placed, okay? Uh, CEO, CXO, VP, senior VPs, EVPs, you know, every, I used to ask, uh, you know, when I was doing programs, you know, this guy's being paid, you know, five million bucks a year. And this pee on down here is, and then I'd try and gauge being paid a lousy 200,000 bucks a year. And was like, that's good money, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah, no. And I said, why is this guy getting paid five million? This person being paid two and 200,000 is real money. Come on, that's good money. But what's the difference? And they'd say, well, it's, person being paid to make good decisions. Well, guess what? No company is paying somebody 200,000 or even 100,000 a year or $80,000 a year to make bad decisions, but they're different decisions. Mm -hmm. These are operational, tactical, in the moment operating decisions. These are future looking uh, and so on. And you know, the man who can see around corners and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So what the person, what these high level executives are being paid for is their ability to look into the future. That's what mm -hmm. leadership is. That's what vision is. Vision is the ability to see something the other people aren't seeing yet. Mm -hmm. I'm leading you toward that vision. Okay. Well, so what they're being paid for is the clarity of their crystal ball. And anyone who come in and squirt a little Windex on their crystal ball, going to be welcome. Oh, there's your Greek wedding. Nice. There it is. There it is. Got it. So, so what is Windex? Okay. It's trends. It's values. It's um, best practices. It's it's experience and best practices from other organizations across the world with the same challenges as you. And where are they going? See, what can we extrapolate from those things? That's what they want to talk about. You want to talk about your product and all the great things it does? That's great, but not here, man. Yeah. Down there, that's what they work on, and they're good at it. And that's what part two is about. Well, well listen, we may bring you back then, Barry, for part two, yeah. given, given the timing. And, and so, um, first of all, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. It's been great to meet you. I, I knew about you on paper. So somebody who's been through Miller Hyman and CSO, I absolutely had to had to get in front of. In fact, you founded CSO Insights. I always loved it. Mm -hmm. um, but with Sales Mastery today, what do you do and how do people learn more about you folks? Well, that's uh, evolving as well. And, and that's the whole idea, you know, sales mastery is the whole idea of lifelong learning, and continuous improvement and continuous growth. And, you know, I said earlier that I think we've just scratched the surface. Um, there's a lot available. And, and, you know, I was hoping we'd talk about some other things. You had Sally Duby. I know Sally really well. And, and you know, what's happening with uh, BDRs and SDRs today, I think is just, I think it's not good. OK, I, I could say more than that. I'll just say I don't think that's a great way to welcome people into the profession. So mm -hmm. anyway, sales mastery, the best way to check us out is either, you know, sales school 2.0 on YouTube or salesmastery.com. Uh, all my contact information is in LinkedIn. 
love to hear from folks. The, the thing that we're, we're now embarking on, this is the one thing that's new, I'll just share this and um, we'll move on. But um, we are now, because the sales performance scorecard is out, we do have data. Um, we're offering um, insights to CSOs, particularly new CSOs, to find out what they inherited. And it's a you know low fixed fee. Um, and we, here's what's different. We, we survey their managers and, and their sellers, their leadership. We can tell them where the gaps are. Anybody can do that. And, and we've even said, well, we'll give you the survey. You have to come up with your own questionnaire. But what we can also do is say, okay, here's the size of the prize for addressing these. Uh, here is the cost of not addressing them. And here's the priority in which we would do it because we have data to support all those. That's what other people don't have. And the, the final piece on this, and, it, and we don't do any of those things. So we don't have a dog in the fight. We don't have a horse in the race. Mm -hmm. uh, we just base it on the data. So I think that's going to, um, I think that's going to be a compelling offer in the coming year. And I'm excited because, you know, we haven't been able to do that for a long time. So that's, that's new. That's for the, for the CEOs, sales leaders, whoever's listening to this, for the sellers that are listening and sales managers are listening. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I put my best stuff in those videos because we want it out there. So just check it out. And if you have comments, be in touch. I mean, email Barry at salesmastery.com. It doesn't get any easier than that. Well, thank you, Barry. And all those, all those links, folks, will, will be in the show notes. And thank you for listening today, everybody. So as always, you know, we exist with the selling well so that we can help improve the performance and professionalism of B2B sales. And in doing so, just improve the lives of salespeople. And we know um, that, that podcasts like this can be helpful. And if you enjoyed this today, great. Like and subscribe to the podcast. And thank you. But we also know we can improve. So, so please send your comments to me. And I'm Mark Cox at InTheFunnel.com. We love constructive criticism, and we want to keep making this more valuable to you, the listener. So let us know your thoughts. We're really tough here too. So, so be direct and share constructive criticism. And thank you for that, because that's where you really do us the favor. We'll see everybody next time on The Selling Wealth.